Hi, this is Karis from Launch School with a special presentation for you from one of our students. Launch School student and core graduate Jake speaks about his journey from how he went from being a C student during college and high school to an A plus student at Launch School and the transformation that he underwent to get there. Just to note that this was an informal gather town session that was kindly recorded and there is some distortion and background noise at times. We wanted to share Jake's talk with you because it's a very useful and inspiring discussion about the kind of mindset that you need when studying at launch school. We hope you enjoy it. So no, no one spoke up, but basically like what I, what I've found from being a, a spot lead is that I think probably about yeah, to a fourth of all people who've been, uh, you know, in launch school. Uh, uh, either gotten a conditional pass or not yet on an assessment. Um, and so it's one of those things, like I remember when I got my first conditional pass, um, you, you kind of feel like alone in it, especially if you have a lot of friends who are like, yeah, I've gotten A's um, on everything. Um, and it's kind of, it's easy to be like uh, intimidated by that fact. So like, I'll go into my background on this. So when I came to launch school, I was a pretty lousy student overall. Um, like in high school, like I did just enough to scrape by. And then in college, um, you know, there's the people who are like, oh yeah, you know, I calculated the bare minimum I would, I would need to get on the test in order to like pass a class. I wouldn't even do that. Like I was a guy who wrote like notes and Sharpie on my, my wrists and like barely used them. I literally, I literally use like the hope and pray method, just like go in, see if I can get something done. And, you know, somehow I scrape by. <clears throat> um, and so when I came to launch school, it was kind of a weird place for me to be because I, I hated school. Um, and all of a sudden it was like, all right, here's this really hard academic pursuit in my eyes. Um, and there's also this nice carrot at the end, which is capstone. Um, which is something that I really wanted to do, uh, you know, despite like all the academic stuff, I've, I've always been pretty attracted to the idea of, um, of doing really hard things and capstone seemed really hard. Um, so as I was going through launch school, like the, the, the very first test that I took, um, you know, by some miraculous, whatever, I, I ended up getting like a 95% on the written, which I was pretty ecstatic because I didn't think I'd even get like that good. You know, my, my track record has not been great. So, you know, with that confidence going in, um, I decided to, uh, after that, to kind of like quickly study for the 109 uh, interview and like kind of see what would happen. So I spent a week studying for it and then, um, I, I didn't do any live coding, you know, I just did, you know, practice problems on like code wars. I didn't even really study PDAC. And then when I got to the test, like I did the first question, like right on the nose at 30 minutes. And then after that, I did the second question in like 20. And even so, um, everyone was like, listen, dude, like you, you managed to do the questions, but you, you really didn't do a great job of it. And there was a lot of hiccups. <clears throat> so we're going to give you a conditional pass and you need you know, go on your way. Um, so I was pretty crushed by that. You know, I didn't really, you know, I, I, I kind of thought like, Hey, you know, maybe I, I didn't study that, you know, good for it, but I didn't really know what good studying was supposed to look like. Like I, I really thought that people who got A's just got A's. I, I had never really seen the work that went into getting an A. Like I, I, I really thought it was just something that you got or something that you didn't. <clears throat> Um, which is a ridiculous belief to be honest, but I, I really just thought it was like that. Um, and so, you know, the next, the next test comes, you know, the one, the, the one twenty written, um, and I'm getting prepared for it and, you know, I'm studying harder than I've ever studied in my life. You know, I don't have a system at this point. Um, I'm just kind of writing down notes. I'm writing down definitions, um, just kind of haphazardly just in this one big document, which I, you know, I still use, but there's no structure to it. Um, it wasn't easily searchable. It wasn't, you know, really anything. And I go and take the test. It takes me like two hours and 58 minutes. Like I, I get like right on the nose for the, uh, the written. I think I do fine. Uh, you know, I wait a little bit, another conditional pass. But this time I, I'm at like 75%. Like I'm like right on the edge of not even getting a conditional pass. 
And at this point, like, I'm really distraught. You know, it, it's it's clear to me. I'm like, hey, it seems to me that people who get a bunch of conditional passes don't get in the capstone. I'm, I'm slowly starting to see, you know, my dreams of this, you know, sifting away. <clears> They're <throat> falling through my fingers just because of my own ineptitude, my own inability to to figure this out. But I, I wasn't going to give up. I knew that. Uh, at this point, I'd started to do launch school full time. So, you know, I kind of burned the ships. I didn't have a job. Um, and and the idea of going to another job besides coding w- was frankly terrifying to me, just based on all like the careers I'd been in. It was like, you know, either go through and do launch uh, and um, be a What's that? Uh, sorry, a few of us were lost, so I just retrieved the people who were lost. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. No worries. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, anyway, so it was like, all right, how do, how do I actually do this? So I, I really, I sat down and I looked around. Um, and if you guys had managed to get that study or the like the, the session notes that I put into the Slack journal chat, if you haven't, uh, go pick those up because I um, I list one of like my inspirations for my study system after or, or in there. It's an article most of you probably have read. But anyway, I, I start looking around, you know, I go on YouTube. I'm like, is there anyone who even turned this around? Like, I, I, I know like, hey, look, I can learn guitar. I can learn, you know, how to drive. But, you know, can I learn how to actually be a good student? Is that something that's inherent or is that something that could be learned? Um, and I... I actually didn't even believe that I could learn to be a good student, but I had an inkling that I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I have to at least try. So, um, you know, I asked around um, and, you know, one of my friends at the time, you know, asked him, hey, like, what'd you get on, on the test? He's like, oh, I got a 98%. I, I, was, I was dumbfounded. I was like, how did you get a 98%? How did you miss like one point? Like, that's insane. Um, and just kind of out of desperation, I was like, dude, like, what, what do you do? to do that. And he was like, well, uh, you know, I'll tell you what I did. So I, I went through the material like two or three times. I did every practice problem two times in the spot, uh, wiki. I did every exercise two times I did. Um, you know, I, I, I made flashcards to memory and then I, I went through and I made a definition in my own terms for every single term in the course. I was like, yeah, of course you got an A plus like, like who wouldn't after that amount of work. Um, and along with the article, I'll let you guys read the article, but basically that guy, he was working like nine hours a day. He did like 600 plus exercises. And I was like, well, yeah, of course you're going to get an A. Like you, you work to the point of, of like near exhaustion. Like there's nothing that you can't know for this test. Um, and so it just kind of, you know, it was a shot in the dark, but I was like, okay, I, I kind of been a, a person where it's like, well, I know 90% of the material. So therefore I can probably be, a, it's probably enough to get by. And at the same time, I was wanting to do launch school as fast as possible. So I was going like, well, I probably know enough to get by. So I, I'm just not gonna go any further than that. But really that kind of ended up with me with two conditional passes. So I was like, okay, instead of doing that, I'm gonna go over every single thing to an absolute A plus certainty. Um, so with that, for the 120, uh, the 120 interview, I, um, I practiced recording myself 120 times with, you know, flashcards, you know, problems. I practiced my diction. I practiced enunciation. I went through, I made a study guide for every single term in the course in my own words. And I just really like nailed it down. I got to the point where I was looking at questions like, what is polymorphism? And I was getting upset that I was being asked that by Anki. I was like, <clears throat> I was like, this this question's so easy that it's not even worth my time. Um, but you know, lo and behold, it took me about sixty hours to prepare for the uh, the interview. I get in there, um, I do my thing, um, and, and, and the cool part about it was is like in the interview, I like for the first like five minutes, I was nervous. But after that, the preparation just like kicked in and and just everything vanished. And it was just it was just rote memory at that point. I was just firing stuff off. Um, And at the end, you know, an hour and a half later, I I look down, I get an email and it's you know, it's the great. And I I don't look at it. I actually make a point of like 
sitting down and and completely like coming to grips with the fact that I may have gotten them out yet. Um, I open up the email and it's an A plus. And I, I don't like that will honestly be like one of the happiest moments of my entire life because not only was it the fact that I had gotten an A plus, but it was the fact that like I had overcome my years of conditioning, believing that it was impossible for me to get A's and to work hard. Can everyone mute their microphone, please? Thank you. Um, so um, anyway, it, it was probably one of the most distinct moments of my entire life. And it's one that I won't forget. But it, it kind of led me to believe that there's a lot of people like me who don't understand how to study. You know, maybe like going up in school, you had the same beliefs as I did that it's impossible to get an A, but you know, you're here anyway, and you're trying to get this done. So um, there's a few rules and like systems that I wanna go over in order to like, for this to be possible for me. So, you know, the, the first and foremost, um, don't ever take a test unless you're sure you can get 100% on the test. And the reason for that being that in law school, like anything below an A, you have to kind of consider is not good enough. Um, especially if you're trying to do this as fast as possible, every time you get a conditional pass or not yet, just add on like three days to a week to the time that you, t that you need to take. And if you're doing this full time and you, you don't have infinite money, that's time that's, um, that's, you know, not spent well. Um, in addition, like, as you get, like, you know, if you're in 109, I think the first 109 written test is like a hundred points or so. Um, after that, they, they, they hover around like 63 points. And what that kind of translates to is that you can miss maybe like three or four points total. And what that also means is like, you know, even if you do know this stuff 100%, there's still human error. You know, like I remember on a test, I missed a point for uh, missing a semicolon, or I missed two points for missing a semicolon. The, the answer wasn't wrong. It was just, you know, it wouldn't run because of the semicolon. Uh, so I guess by that nature, it was wrong. But the point is, is that you can't really account for human error. Um, so to, to combat that, you kind of need to look like under every stone. You know, if there's an article in the course, you got to read it. If there's like discussion questions in the lesson, you got to go over them. You, you really got to go through every single thing. Um, and if you if you got the lesson notes that I posted to the general forum, um, uh, down at the bottom there, you'll see this thing called the A plus checklist. And this is really what I use to keep myself on track, because how do you know when you're ready to get an A plus on a test? And, and the answer is, is like you go through these and you make sure that every single box is ticked off. Um, and if you do this right, there should be this moment where like you're nervous for the few days leading up to the test. And to, like the night before, you're just kind of looking at your study stuff and going, there's really nothing that I could possibly do to study more for this test. And at that point, that's when you've studied enough, when like you actually sleep well the night before. It doesn't mean you won't be nervous in the test, but it just means that, you know, like you kind of resigned yourself to the fact that if something goes wrong, there's nothing I realistically could have done. Um, and this is like the way to keep on track of that. So. Uh, my buddy actually, so I do mine on uh, pencil and paper because it was just easier for me to look at like a notebook and and, and do it. But uh, a buddy of mine actually made this um, and he kind of broke it down. And so like there's things that you need to do for every course, every time. And then there's like stuff to each individual course that you need to decide what to put on. So some of the stuff, uh, as you can see, like you got to read the lectures twice, at least. I end up doing it like three or four times. You need to define every term in the course, answer in your own words, flashcards, and you get 100% on every quiz, read every article, do the exercises twice. Um, another thing, you need to like practice taking the test. You need to practice being in a test environment. Because anyone who's taken an interview here will know, um, doesn't matter how smart you are, you, your IQ drops by like 15 to 30 points when you're in front of somebody. So um, you got to prepare for it. You have to prepare being in a timed test environment um you know because if you go over by you know even a minute you're you're getting docked like 10 percent on top of whatever error that you made um like if you're doing a test in over three hours you weren't prepared 
that's just you know what it is um on top of that like if you move to each individual course this is just going to be stuff that you know that you need to learn so uh, you know a good example of this is in 130 um the unary and symbol like really nailing that down that's an example of something that you need to put like if you're even fuzzy a little bit on something you need to put it down and you only check that box off when you're looking at it and you're like yeah i can define this in my own words i could rattle this off right now off the top of my head that's when you know that like the the stuff well enough um and then going on with um what my process is for beginning a new course it actually doesn't start with the a plus checklist that's that that doesn't come in until like step three this isn't like an actual like stepped out process that i did this is just kind of like a natural course of action um so you know first things first go through the course i, I would kind of do somewhere between like a skim and you know really understanding the material like i wouldn't like if there was something i didn't really understand it, it wasn't the biggest deal to really learn it the first time um it was more important to actually just get familiar with the material um you know this kind of resulted i you know i probably average around like d's or f's for the quizzes like I, i'm not i didn't do very good at them at all but it, it's fine because it's not the first time that you're going to do them um you know it, one of the, the stipulations is that you have to get 100 percent on every quiz before you proceed to the test um, you know, luckily launch school has a thing where you can hide your test answers and just go through them on, like on a, on a pencil and paper and just like mark off, you know, what's right, what's not, um, you know, and this, and then moving on to the second step, you can pretty much either choose between doing the exercises or doing a second pass of the material. If you think that the second pass will help you with the, the exercises, it's just kind of up to you. You can kind of do either. Um, but by now, like the material could, should kind of start sinking in a little bit. Um, and you should start kind of seeing things. And all of a sudden, those concepts that seemed more difficult in your first pass start to become a little bit more clear and you can move through them with greater ease. Um, moving on to step three, this is where after either the exercises or the second pass, this is where you should make your A plus checklist. Like you just need to, you know, make those like the must do's for every course. Um, and you need to make the stuff that you're, you know you're fuzzy on. Um, step four, um, this is where like one of the biggest things is to make a definition of every part of the course. And this really does count as your third pass of the material, because by the time you're done making all your definitions, you'll have gone through the stuff like three, four times. Um, so that's like really where you can start to nail down, you know, how well you understand something. Um, and after that, it's just like, look at the discussions for every course, because sometimes there's a lot of questions that people have already asked that you have, or people have asked questions that you didn't even know that you had. And uh, the staff always answer them very, very well. So this is where you can really start to flush out an even deeper understanding of what's going on. Uh, and then finally, step six is just like checking off the miscellaneous items on the list. You don't have to do everything in order. Um, you know, if you want to read like the discussion questions first, or if you want to do the exercises two or three times before um, you move on, then, you know, that's the way it is. Um, but at that point, that's when you can start thinking about taking the test is when you're getting to the end of the list. And, you know, you, you might even sort of feel exhausted with the material, you, like you really just might be sick of that course at that point. Uh, but that's a good thing. Um, so the, the whole premise around my idea, I mean, I don't think that a lot of people who maybe got have gotten good grades prior to coming to launch school will, will get a lot out of this, just because I think that if you've gotten good grades before this, you probably already did a form of this, or uh, maybe your anxiety kind of helped you study and, you know, be prepared. Um, but this is really for people who, you know, have no idea how to do this. Um, you know, the funny thing is, too, is that, you know, people say there aren't any shortcuts. There's absolutely a shortcut. And it's funny because the shortcut is actually just like really, really hard, repetitive work, just going over stuff to the point of nausea. That's really the shortcut. 
Um, because this, like, even though this sounds like it, it would take a long time, I mean, take for, you know, take the fact that I've, I've been full time in logical since October, um, into, into this statement, but, uh, it, it would usually take me about like three, three and a half way, uh, weeks to blow through a course. Um, and it, it seemed to me that it was, it was a pretty quick pace. So, um, Cause you got to think like, you might be like, Oh, Hey, you know, I know this stuff like well enough to maybe get an A and you might get through on that. I don't know, but you're, you're kind of increasing your odds of getting a bad grade and having that count against you either for capstone or, or whatnot. Um, so it's just, I, I really can't stress enough, like knowing the material a hundred percent, turning over every stone, looking under every rock. That's kind of really the way launch school is supposed to work. Um, that's sort of the brunt of the conversation. I would now like to open up stuff for just general questions. And this can just be questions about launch school itself. Um, you know, like how long would it take? You know, uh, like it took me 1163 hours to get through the course. I have a friend who did it in around a thousand. I probably would have been around a thousand too, had not been for the, uh, the conditional pass, and then the not yet. You guys can just speak out if you have a question. Hey, Jake. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So Chris, thank you so much for doing this. It's actually really helpful to hear your insights on how to approach um, the studying process. Yeah. Um, and I have a question. Uh, so I'm currently preparing for the 109 interview. I've never done um, like an interview like this before. So it's my yeah. first time. And you mentioned something earlier. You said that like the first five minutes of any assessment, regardless of whether it's like written or an interview are like kind of like the most nerve wracking part mm -hmm. of the assessment. And then you kind of fall into your groove and you can kind of like answer questions as you would normally. Mm -hmm. um, and that was exactly my experience for the written. The first five minutes were like, yeah. This might as well be written in a foreign language <laughs> because I can't yeah. read anything. And then after that, I got into a groove and it was a much more pleasant experience to answer questions. So when you're in an interview and the first five minutes are really critical because that's when you're first wrapping your head around the problem and like looking at the test cases and trying to understand, you know, figure out your strategy. Like, what do you recommend for people to do in those first five minutes when like your nerves are at the highest? And you kind of really need to focus during that time. So I, so I apologize because I have a tendency to go deep on these questions, probably deeper than need be. But like my philosophy with studying and going through this kind of, kind of points to the fact that there's these human emotions that you just really can't get past. And, you know, one of those is panic and the, the the test isn't isn't just about your knowledge it's also about terror management so when you're in those first first five minutes you might be useless i mean that's just kind of it like you need to focus but you it's just not going to work out in some regards you know I, I would say like having like a process that you're supposed to do in those first five minutes is probably like good I, you know I guess a better answer to your question would be like in the first five minutes I would go through and, you know, I had a numbered sheet already pre-made. You don't need to make this before because that, that cuts in, or you do need to make this before because it cuts into your time if you do it on the test, but you should make like one to 20 questions just numbered one to 20. Um, I used a, like a shape system to be like, how, how hard is this? So circles were for easy questions, triangles for medium and uh, squares for hard. Um, and, you know, the first thing I would do um, is just maybe bust out like one or two easy questions, um, you know, just to kind of calm down. Like I, I typically don't get into the groove of a test until like 10, 15 minutes in. Um, and at the same time, if you're not prepared, that panic might not go away. Like like the panic only goes away if you're prepared. Um because like when I was doing the 109 interview assessment, it never went away the whole time. Um, actually, this is a good thing. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention. So um, after I created this, this study system, um, I got A's for most of the rest of, of core. 
and I was I was pretty ecstatic about it. By the time I got to like two fifteen, um, it's not that I was dipping in like motivation. It was more like um, like maybe I got like too used to getting A's at that point. Um, but you know, regardless, I still went through the motions. Like I, uh, if for anyone who doesn't know, two fifteen is like purely a coding interview. Um, and it's with questions that are just a little bit harder than the 109 questions, but it's kind of like ultra PDAC. So like your first 30 minutes should really be spent on PDAC. Um, so like to, to study for that test, I exclusively studied with questions that were going to be harder than was on the test. I, I made sure that I could solve them in 25 minutes or less on most of them. At max, I would go like 35 minutes to 40 minutes. I made sure to uh, live code with, in front of people. I think the first time I took it, I live coded like 12 or 13 times in front of people. Again, exclusively questions that were going to be harder. And, um, and and the one thing about life is that, you know, the best laid plans will always go to waste somehow. It's just kind of how it is. So, you know, I, I, I get in the test, you know, first 30 minutes go perfectly. Like I, I, I do a great PDAC. In my opinion, I do a great PDAC. Um, you know, I, I plan out exactly how I'm going to solve the problem. It's very clear in my head how I need to solve this. And all of a sudden, the code just does something that I've never seen before. You know, I was convinced it was an indexing error or something. Um, but like out of all the practice, I've been doing JavaScript like 200 hours at that point. So I was pretty familiar with JavaScript. Um, and I was just looking at this code and I was like, what's going on? And I had like five minutes to figure it out before I would start getting doc points. So I was like, really, if I'm going to get an A, the only thing I can do is try to figure this out because I'm so close to a solution and I can't really go back to my algorithm and rip it all up. Um, so, uh, you know, I spend the next 20 minutes just trying to beat a dead horse, essentially. And, uh, you know, I, I never gave up. But at the end of the hour, he's like, that's time, man. You know, that it is what it is. Uh, and so unsurprisingly, I got a not yet. And, you know, at that point, I was like, you know, despite how hard you can work for something, there's going to be times where it just isn't going to work out. Um, but that's actually not something to be afraid of, because from that failure, it was actually a really beautiful experience um, because it, it just kind of like showed me that, hey, like getting A's like isn't everything. Mistakes are fine, but really like bouncing back from those mistakes is probably one of the best parts about being human. And, you know, after that course, I, I went on to get like three A pluses, which is the most I'd gotten in a row. Um, and then, you know, last, last test I got was like an A. So it was, uh, you know, overall it was a good experience. And it's one of those things too, like if you're, if you're like studying for the 109 assessment and you've reached that point where you're already like, I don't know how I could study more, but you keep putting it off. You're just going to have to kind of face it at some point, you know, like there's all this, we're all going to feel panic and we're all going to, you know, feel fear about this stuff, but facing that and overcoming that is probably one of the best parts about launch school, to be honest. Um, I'm shocked that it's only, you know, 200 a month, to be honest. Um, but yeah, any other uh, questions? Um, I've got maybe a question. Um, yeah. So when you're like kind of re going over material, uh well for one just out of curiosity what's your preferred like note taking uh method i think you said pen and paper earlier um i don't use pen and paper for notes because it you know one you want a searchable document you don't want to be flipping through pages i know like people say that you get like some benefit from rote memory by mm -hmm. you know writing stuff down i don't think that that's that beneficial. I think what's more beneficial is hitting control F on a document and then just typing a word and finding it. Um, sure. And in addition, um, I kind of use like a red, yellow, green system. So like red is for stuff that I, I'm definitely shaking on and I need to go back and revise. And then obviously yellow and green, you guys can get the, the idea. Um, but I find that that's uh, the best way for me. Um, and plus, you can like copy and paste information if you if, if you think that someone else has like a better definition and like you can kind of like copy off of that or uh, or, or maybe it's just like a, someone has a diagram and you're like, I'm not going to draw my own diagram. I'd rather just have it here. Um, you know, it's good for that, too. So I use I use Google Docs.
Okay, for sure. Is that like what you reference uh, when you're kind of reiterating over the material or do you ever kind of go back to the actual like books and things that are uh, part of the launch school material? I do it all. Okay. I do it all. Uh, like, um, like if ever you're, you're faced with a question of just like, you know, what's more useful, what's more efficient. My, my, my method isn't about efficiency. It's about like working to the point where it just like, a, you shouldn't get a bad grade, like use every material at your disposal. Um, and, and like when you're, ch when you're faced with like a harder path, like, like, okay, it would be easier to do this or harder to do this, but I would learn more. Always choose the harder path pretty much every time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I actually I have one more. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's more just about launch school in general. Yeah. Um, in in your experience, um, how like which courses would you say like take longer relative to other courses? I know this is probably different for everybody, mm -hmm. but being at the right. beginning of the of the experience, I'm trying to get a sense of like, how long could this take? Is right. every course like RB 101 where this takes a really long time? Right, that, that's a great question. Um, so 101 is easily the longest course, in my opinion. Um, be, and then that's not necessarily because of the material. Um, it's, it's mostly because this is the first time that you're being introduced to the logical method. You know, you don't know how to study yet. You don't know what the, how long the assessment is. You don't know any, you, you've never done anything like that. Like, um, like there's that huge hump that is 109. Um, it took me, I mean, I was part-time when I did 109, but I, it took me like four months to get through. Like it, it took a little while. Um, when after, like, as soon as I got after that, it would, it would typically take me like three and a half weeks there about to, to blast through a course. Um, I think like 170 took me like 17 days. 180 took me 17 days. Again, this is before they had the 185 assessment um, or 189 assessment. Um, so I didn't have to do that. But, you know, I think all together, those took me like around like five weeks, um, like both of them. And so like I was, I finished 109 in October. Um, and now I'm prepping for capstone and I finished in, uh, I finished on June 9th. So um, but like that being said, I was doing five hours a day, six days a week. And some, and, and for the first part of it, I was doing like, when I was part-time, I was doing three hours a day, seven days a week. And then, um, and then five hours a day, seven days a week, when I went full-time and then now, and, but then I found that you can't really do seven days a week. Uh, you can typically do it for maybe like three weeks. And then you can't look at a computer for like three days after that. So it's actually more efficient for you to take a day off and just really not doing anything. Um, oh, and another thing just about like studying. Um, so there's kind of this idea, like how long should I be studying? Cause like no one really like keeps track of each other's uh, other's time, you know? Um, cause if you're doing part-time and your job's pretty demanding, like three hours might be all you got. And it might be tough to do three hours. I, I've been there. It, it's it's rough. And, you know, don't ever feel bad if someone's, you know, zipping along because you don't know their prior coding experience too. You know, like that person might have had a background in IT. They might have been through a boot camp before. Um, you know, they might be full time uh, and, and they might just be animals and they're doing nine hours a day, which is insane. I can't I can't do nine hours right now. Um, you know, I, I've gotten up to seven. Um but even that, I mean, like that takes all day for me, um, you know, like that's waking up, um, using like nootropics, like caffeine and acetylcholine strategically. So like waking up, you know, pounding a coffee, getting right on the computer, probably getting like two and a half, three hours in before lunch. And then after lunch, um, get right back to it. But like between that, like I, I, I kind of find I can go like an hour and 20 minutes, hour, 30 minutes before I start like really just looking at the paper or looking at the screen and just like the gears start slipping. Like I can't really like read stuff and actually actively comprehend it. Um, so you have to take those breaks. Um, I know the Pomodoro technique is kind of bandied about as being really great. And I used it for quite a time, uh, quite some time. The problem that I found with it is that when you're taking a break every 25 minutes or so, you like, maybe you'll hop on TikTok or you'll do something and that, and it's really not a five minute break, but you'll end up doing like five, 10, 15, maybe even 20 minutes. 
and that all adds up. And I, I stopped it because, you know, I would finish the day at like 10 o'clock just going like, why did it take me from like nine to 10 to do five hours? Like that shouldn't, you know, be happening. Um, so I, I just didn't find it as useful as just, you know, pounding out as much as I could and then taking a break for a little bit, pounding out as much as I could and taking a break. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else? Um, Jake, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, again, I arrived like 10, 20 minutes late, so maybe you've covered this, maybe not. Uh, I apologize if you did. Yeah, no worries. no worries. But when you're, when you're clocking in your study time, um, yeah. particularly speaking, right? When you're sitting down to study, I'm going to do my five hours. Um, does it matter if those five hours feel, whether they are or are not a different question, but if they feel very productive, full of aha moments, or if they just feel, okay, I sat in here, uh, I mm -hmm. hit my head on, on many walls many times, but at the very least, I counted those five hours. So is it about being there, or is it about the, the gain that you perceive that you got? So I... My fiance has a different take on this, um, but I, I kind of come from the school of thought of like intensity and self-sacrifice in order to meet a standard that I set for myself, whether that actually be realistic or not, um, sometimes to my detriment. Um, so I, I kind of put it as like, like, just like like the absolute law that was greater than myself that I was going to hit five hours every day. Um, and after, you know, like you can only do six day weeks before, like for so long before, like, you, you know, it's like Wednesday and you're hitting those walls that you're talking about. Like you're just looking at the material and it's like painful to even get like 15 minutes in, like you can get like 15 at a time. And then like, you're like, I got to take a break. Like I just really can't look at this anymore. Um, if you're hitting those walls, like I actually hit that on Tuesday. Um, and uh, my mom actually convinced me to take a break. Like we were on a call and she was like, dude, you gotta, you gotta calm down. Like you gotta go and just not do anything for a couple of days. So I'm taking, yeah, I took yesterday off and the day off. Um, but I, I would kind of say it's, it's important that you keep going if you can, um, you know, cause like, you know, maybe if you if you kind of let just like your feelings dictate your study habits, there's a lot of room to just be like, ah, well, I don't really feel like it today. So I guess I just, you know, I'll take another break. But, you know, how many days is that? You know, how many days do you really need for that? Because like a lot of the times, like I'll even sit down after lunch and be like, oh, man, like I am I am like I have a food coma right now. Like I can't I can't study. Um, and then I get into it and then all of a sudden, two hours later, I'm like, wow, that was two hours. So, you know, a lot of the times, like your feelings lie, like, like you, you actually probably don't know what you need most of the time. Um, so I, I kind of find it easier to have like an absolute rule that you hit every day. And then if you just can't, like, sometimes you just got to throw in the towel, but, um, but maybe just take like a day or, or like two days. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I noticed that we had a couple of questions in the text area. I'm not sure oh, if you yeah. were able to spot that. No, no, I don't. I don't even know how to get to the text area. Ah, um, lower right hand corner. It usually says participants. Oh. Right next to it, it should say chat. Okay, awesome. So the first question I'm seeing, would it be helpful to write an info dump of the information that you're confident that you know during the second reread of the course? Um, you know, that's just kind of up to personal preference. Um, I, I, I thought about doing that because I was like, well, maybe it's more efficient for me to make my notes as I'm going. Um, but I just never really got into it because I, I don't really like note taking. So I would kind of put it off to like almost the end of my time in that course because I just didn't like doing it. Um, and, and so typically like the days leading up to a test, it's like, okay, there's no more fun stuff to do. Like I can't, I can't blast through like a hundred problems or something like that, which I, I find pretty enjoyable. Um, you know, I have to sit down and do it. So 
you know, at that point, it's just up to personal preference. Just, you know, what's most important is that you get the stuff on the paper. That's, that's kind of first and foremost, what you should be looking at. Uh, and then the second question, and Nico, feel free to uh, speak up if you, if you have another uh, add on to that. <clears throat> um, so second question, when you're stuck on a problem during a project or problem set, how do you get unstuck or how long do you wait to look at a solution? So that really depends. Um, never feel bad if you don't quite have it yet. Um, a lot of the times, like like when I was going through the 109 uh, practice problems or the small problems exercises, the first time I did it, 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 it took me like weeks. It took me like two or three weeks to like get through all those problems. Uh, and there was just like some problems where I'm looking at it and I'm like, I don't even know where to start, to be honest. Um, you know, and even so you do it anyway, like you, you at least try it. But if you really get there and you're like, I, I just don't know this, then look at it um, because it, it, it doesn't really say anything about your intelligence or anything like that that you can't figure it out. A lot of the times just something that you didn't know um, and you can't really get down on yourself for not knowing something you didn't know. Um, and, and so the second time I did problems, consequently, consequently, it, it probably took me like five hours to, to do the problems the second time. Like I just blasted through them. Um, so, you know, don't like the solutions are there, not as like, a, as a point of failure, but really as a point of learning how to code, learning how to code cleanly, and then looking at other students solutions who, like I said, maybe they've done a boot camp, maybe they've gone on, on code wars and done like 600 plus problems. There might be some like a ternary operator that you never really thought about. Like, I think everybody here knows the, the feeling of like working for half an hour on a solution and like, it's like two or three methods long. And then you look at a solution that someone did in two lines and you're like, wow, I'm the stupidest person alive. Um, but I mean, like the, the thing with that two line solution is now you know how to do it. Um, you know, like maybe someone used regex and you've never seen it before. Um, it's, it's a great way to learn stuff that you've just never known before. Um, anyone have any questions to add to that or anything like that? Um, I was just curious, after you got your first A+, plus, um, did you feel like that helped mitigate your nerves on the next assessment at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, no, it's, it's, you'll, you'll be nervous on every single assessment. Usually the euphoria lasts, uh, maybe a day or two and then, uh, and then it's just over. Um, but like, uh, like I, I'm not really a person who thinks that you got to feel good all the time. I actually think that that's like one of the biggest lies that we've been told. Um, like the fact that it's like, how do I like erase nervousness? Like you don't. You really, really don't. Um, but it's really about like digging deep, grabbing onto that feeling, and just writing. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool! I can mute people. Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, I want to see if there's anything I want to add to that. Um, I was afraid you were going to say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, 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 it's something um, like the fact that law school only costs $200 a month is, is ludicrous, in my opinion, because like, you know, I, you know, I, I've been playing guitar a few years before, uh, before law school. And I felt like I was hot stuff. I was like, man, I can, you know, like I'm, I'm practicing guitar an hour a day. And my coworkers were just like, oh, wow. Oh, gee, you're doing something that's not, uh, you know, watching TV. Like, that's pretty amazing. But like after law school, like I know I haven't really played for like a year because I've just been on this. Um, but I know that when I go back, it's like, oh, I know how I would study for it. I'm going to study for it like an assessment. I'm going to lay out like all like the, the notes and I'm going to memorize them. I'm going to make flashcards. I'm going to go through it. I'm going to spend like three hours a day on it and just like get really, really good at it. So like not only do you learn how to code, but you learn how to deal with those really tough emotions and you learn how to be really, really thorough. 
which I think that, you know, by itself, I think mean, this should cost like 20 grand just for core, not even including capstone. Um, but uh, anything else? So this may sort of be relevant and the answer may be somewhat obvious, I'm not sure, but I know I personally have a hard time with the courses that are um, more, it, you learn more by doing instead mm -hmm. of learn more by, by theory. So like the 175, especially, um, is a lot of, you know, we'll do this next and then we'll do this next right. and then we'll do this next. And it's, um, it's more difficult for me to stay engaged. And I don't know if anyone else, you know, struggles with this, but I'm wondering if you had any sort of um, tips for that or experience with just the different tackling the different kind of structure there. Uh, yeah, and, and and like the answer is actually similar to, you know, what I was ta I was telling Jacob just a second ago, which is there's just going to be stuff that sucks. I mean, like for me, like 211 was, um, you know, despite the fact that it was a new language, like I just kind of found it pretty boring. Um, it was, you know, a lot of stuff that it was kind of like the worst, the worst like time when you learn stuff is when you already know like half the material or like you feel like you understand it intuitively um, because it's so easy to let your guard down. And just be like, yeah, you know, I got it. Like, I understand it. It's it's nothing really special. But it also makes like digging through those those pages really tough because like there's gonna be that paragraph where you find out that um, you know, with JavaScript, like it like you can reach outside the scope of a method um, or a function, um, and you don't have to pass anything in. Which coming you know from a Ruby guy was like a big revelation or first class function. And so, and so really, um, that's kind of why I liked, like, I didn't, didn't like using the five hours as kind of this thing I had to hit because no matter what, even if you didn't like it, you still had to hit the five. So, um, you know, sitting there and just getting in, and this is where like using nootropics strategically, like caffeine, like using that strategically to boost motivation. Um, I also recommend acetylcholine, which, um, which like I have ADHD, so it's like I didn't I don't want to take like the meds, um, but I, I found that this was a great way. Which like wake up, take acetylcholine, and and for me there's a distinct difference. Like if I like if I'm not taking it versus when I'm taking it. And, and by the way, this is like a, a regular supplement. It's like as safe as vitamin D. Like it's nothing crazy. It's it's uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, but I, I kind of find that if I'm struggling, it's easier to just take one of those and and ride it out. Um, but yeah, just digging deep. That's really it. There, there's not really any special advice. Oh, uh, Nico, um, how do you know when you're challenging yourself enough? You know, that's an excellent question. That That's one that goes really deep. Um, because like, what is a challenge? Because like, for me, I was really challenging myself and the 120 written, you know, that was the hardest I'd ever studied. But like, the thing was, is that it turns out the hardest I've ever studied still wasn't very hard because I never actually studied that hard in my entire life. So what's your frame of reference? So you, you might not even know when you're challenging yourself enough until you get your first A. Or you might not know until you're challenging yourself not as much until you get like a, a failing grade. So this is kind of is one of those things where you're just going to have to bite the bullet and just, I guess, find out. Uh, you know, don't be afraid of failure. Like I have two conditional passes and a not yet, and I still got into capstone. Um, but in large part, you know, when I talked to Chris after, cause after I got the not yet, like I just kind of went to him and I was like, listen, man, like, you know, what are my odds? Um, and he's like, well, not great to be honest. Um, but, uh, but, you know, he's like, well, what happened with the not yet? And I kind of told him that I had studied really hard. He's like, okay, actually, you know, your chances are a little bit better. But, you know, when I got into Capstone, he said, like, well, one of the things that, you know, kind of made the decision um, 
or helped us make the decision, I guess, was when I did fail, I bounced back from it. So it's not so much about, you know, hey, I failed. It's, you know, what do you do with that failure? Do you give up or do you you dig deeper and you and you work harder than you worked before? You know, this is a journey about growth, you know, and some people, it won't be that some people have gotten A's the entire time. And I'm jealous of those people, believe me. But like, um, you know, if you're one of the people who has failed, I'm living proof that you can turn it around. Um, and if I can do it, so can you. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Hey, man. Hey, so, you know, I love that point that you made about that. Like you thought that you're working pretty hard and then you realize like, your hard work is not even is not as good enough. And so yeah. you know, I can really relate to your story because for me, like, you know, I kind of cruised through high school and college too. And then mm -hmm. for people like me and you, you come to law school and you're like, your best is not good enough. Right. right? And right. you have that great moment when you're like, man, like this is this is another level. Um, mm -hmm. because I got I am not yet on my it would be one of nine uh -huh. on my interview. And I feel like it's that you know, my belief with people just in general is like, you don't change your behavior until you feel enough pain to do so, right? And so that pain- Right there, that you, right there. The absolutely. That felt at that time, it's like, okay, like, I'm not, am I gonna drag our, are we gonna drag our heels all the way to the end? Or are we gonna like do something fundam fundamentally fundamentally different, right? Right, right. Um, so it's, uh, so yeah, actually my question to you, just kind of building off of that was, like, um, well, to take a step back, I believe that for for students like us who came into law school who weren't A plus students, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I went through college with the model like C's get degrees, right? Just Me like get out as soon as possible, do whatever you can. Um, and I believe that it's our belief that kind of holds us back, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're just like, it's it's become part of your identity that you're right. kind of like a C student. Right? right. So when you come to law school and you see like flashcards, Pomodoro, it's like this stubbornness that you don't want to change. Right. right. And I can say this to you, Jake, because I lo I'm looking at your, your sheet right now that you posted on Medium. Uh -huh. And even in my mind, there's like a little rebellion. It's like, no, that's, <laughs> that's too much. That's right. just like, yeah. that's too much. Cause like, cause that's not me. Right. Like that's that all I'll say to myself. That's not me. I figured out my own way. I got my own, you know, my own plan, this and that. So uh, kind of just to tie this all together, it's like, at what point did you believe that you could become, you were that student that you can never, you never imagined for yourself, right? The first time, and dude, like I, everything you said, it was almost like I was talking like, like a, a year ago, like, cause I would just look at stuff and just be like, nah, I mean, come on. I don't really have to do that. Like I right. could just, I could just do whatever, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and the, like, the thing was, is like, I had like a chip on my shoulder coming into law school, because like, I thought I was stupid, you know, for the most part, or, or going, you know, as I, as I got older, I was like, oh, maybe I'm not stupid. But like, like, growing up, especially like with ADHD, I just kind of believed it. I believed I couldn't get good grades. And like, the moment that that really switched for me was after I got my first A plus, because it completely bulldozed my whole past. It was like, but like up until that point, like even when I was studying, I would like after I took the test, I would like you couldn't have you couldn't have convinced me that I got an A plus, even though I, I studied 60 hours, not including the time I already studied for the written for this test. I, I recorded myself uh, like interviewing 120 times. Like I went through the flashcards ad nausea. Like it, it, like, of course, I like I practiced writing out answers. I went through like the written test and I interviewed as if they were questions. And like, after all that, I still felt like I was going to fail because that's just, that was a part of my identity. Um, and so after I got that first A plus it, it bulldozed it. And all of a sudden it was like, wait a second, I can be that, you know? And, and it was, and when I say it was one of the best moments of my entire life, it's because like I broke free of the chains of, you know, all the kids that called me stupid in elementary school. Or, or all that stuff. And it was incredibly empowering. Um, and so when you do get there, it's, it, it's, it's life changing, in my opinion, because now, like, even now, just as a person, like, I find myself being more thorough, like I plan more, my, my thinking's more structured, 
you know, I, I, you know, I don't wait to take the trash out anymore. You know, when it's full, I take it out, you know, there's dishes, I do them because there's a fundamental change that happens with you. You know, this is, if you do this right. And if you're, you are one of these people, it, it's really about digging deep and becoming a different person who can complete law school, even if you can't right now, actually, uh, you know, this is one of the things I did want to talk about. Um, so does anyone know the difference between a gold medalist and a silver medalist in the Olympics. And, and it's okay, that it was rhetorical, but the, the, the real difference isn't, you know, well, the silver medalist didn't work hard. Like imagine going up to a silver medalist who, you know, practiced like eight, 12 hours a day, dieted to the point of exhaustion, like, you know, swam laps until their fingers turned blue and all that stuff you know, vomited when they got out of the pool. Look at that person and say, well, the reason you didn't get a gold medal is because the gold medalist worked a little bit harder. Like, would you really say that? No, a lot of the times it just comes down to things that you can't control. You know, maybe that runner had a backdraft. Maybe, you know, Michael Phelps was just genetically engineered by like the government to have big flipper fins for feet that he could just paddle around and get gold medals. You know, I mean, th there comes a point where like, your best just isn't good enough. And so with that, it, it, it's kind of become clear to me that there's, there's two versions of failure and only one of them is acceptable. There's the failure where you didn't try hard enough. And then there's the failure where your best wasn't good enough. And the, the only failure that's acceptable is your best wasn't good enough because like, guess what? You're, you're not permanent. Like, like one of the biggest, you know, mistakes in psychology is the idea that your personality is permanent. It absolutely is not like my best friend is a, um, so my fiance is a therapist. My best friend is a doctor in psychology. I myself have a minor in psychology. Um, and, and like, one of the things is, is like, you know, when I took like the big five personality tests, I, I won't explain it. Just look it up. Um, it's the only one that's actually valid. But, um, when I took like the, or one of the only ones, uh, when I took it, you know, uh, the metric for me working hard, like five years ago was in like the bottom 20th percentile. I, I was, I was lazy, just what it was, you know, I've taken it since and I'm in the 80th percentile now. So your personality is by its nature, not permanent. Um, so you can change. So if your best isn't good enough, then you need to change and, and still it is. Was, um, was that conscientiousness? It was conscientiousness. You get, you get yeah. extra points. Yeah. No, I know that because I took the same test and it told me I was lazy. Yeah. No, like, I got the like, same exact score like you. Just It was just like low. I'm like, nah. Yeah. Damn. But, but see, that's a self-fulfilling pro prophecy then. It confirms right. the belief that you're per poor student. I'm like, well, this is just how I am. Like, I'm just not meant to be that smart or right. a hard worker. Right. Yeah. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, a question I had about the, the going through the lectures over and over again, yeah. right? Um, at what point does memorization become understanding? And I'll, I'll elaborate on that because I realized I'm in Ruby 130 now. Mm -hmm. And so I can read courses and I can like take keywords and then have a clear definition like word for word or like what Launch School says, right? Like at this point, if you ask most students, like, you know, variables as pointers, like you'll get the same definitions, right? Mm -hmm. Just because that's what law school uses. Right. Um, so like, how do you, and so like, if I look at a flashcard too, and I see like a word, and I define it word for word, what law school says, that's a, that just means I memorize it. That doesn't mean I necessarily understand the right. concept. So for you, um, like at what point can you distinguish between those two? Typically, um, I actually find that like true understanding only comes about uh, in certain instances. Well, that, maybe that's not true. Um, really, when it when it turns into something that I completely understand is where I I've developed a mental model for it. So like uh, like polymorphism or, or, or duct typing. Like, like when I got the picture in my head that duct typing was uh, the same like name and, and two different classes that did different things, like that's when I truly understood it is when like, you know, for me, um, visualizing what that meant kind of meant, you know, understanding. And, and by the way, uh, 
if there's something that you actually don't intuitively understand, and, and uh, there's a, a term called grokking, if you guys have ever heard it before, uh, but grokking means to intuitively and deeply understand something. Um, so, like, unless you can grok the meaning of a word, don't take the test. Like, put that on your sheet as one of the things you have to do, and develop. And maybe take like thirty minutes to an hour to two hours to really like, like, go through it. Or go to a spot session. Go to a spot session and ask a question because maybe someone who uh, passed the test is a good mental model. Um, like for the unary and symbol, uh, Arian uh, Benazir, he, he taught me the uh, uh, two prop Shakur. And for you guys, if, for those of you who will get into 130 soon, that, that'll, that'll make sense. Um, Oh, okay. And then uh, another question. Uh, in your opinion, what's the best supplemental outside source for Launch School? Uh, the documentation. That's it. I, I don't really go out and, and look for them. And if I do, they're going to be just kind of around. Um, I don't really have like a or stack overflow, stack overflow in the documentation. That's pretty much it. Cool. If there's nothing else, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, so I'll just do like a last call for questions and I'll wait like, I don't know, 30 seconds starting now. Looks like there might be one more in the chat. Oh, cool. <clears throat> so Hamdi said, uh, what's your advice on learning to think more logically? It's super difficult for me at the moment and I get stuck a lot because of it. <clears throat> um, Really, it's just experience. Um, the The shortcut here is just to um, keep running into that wall. Keep keep like butting your head against it, feeling the failure, and using that as your guide. You know, like there's not really like a shortcut here, especially um, when it comes to questions of like, you know, how should I how should I think? Typically, the lessons that you learn shape how you think. Um, you know, it's not like a skill where it's like, okay, move your hand here when you're playing guitar. It's more like, uh, you'll learn it over time just through, through trial and error. Um, you'll just kind of notice that it gets a little bit more logical. Uh, in addition, um, the PDAC process, if you're like me, you didn't like it at first. I, I love the PDAC process now. Um, it, it's like, it's so amazing. Like I'll, I'll have looked at a, a question for 30 minutes to an hour. And, and then, like, I would give up and be like, all right, I'm just going to write it down. And as soon as I PDAC'd it, I would come up with a solution, like, almost immediately. Um, so if you need something to just kind of think logically, use that to organize your steps. Um, and, and really don't, I mean, like, it's not that, and I kind of, like, figured this out in 2.15. Um, the PDAC process isn't a process in addition to the problem-solving process. It literally is the problem-solving process. So um, don't discount it especially if you're in 109. All right, cool. I'll start the timer over. Um, where did you say you can find the um, three different examples of written tests? Uh, it's in the 109 study guide. It's like, like in the middle of the document. And it's like, here's what a, a bad answer looks like here. It's like ABCD. So 109 study guide. Okay. Thank you. Starting the timer again. All right. It's close enough. Um, <clears throat> so here's the thing, guys. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to me. Like, if you guys have any more questions aside from this, like, I'll probably be a part of the logical community for a long time. So um, if you guys have any questions just about, like my philosophy, just really anything. I mean, just kind of think of me as your friend in Capstone um, and just, you know, don't be afraid to reach out as silly as the question could be. You know, I'm pretty much always open. Uh, I don't really have a social life, so that's actually kind of good for me. So um, anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, you know, I'd always dreamed about doing something like this. So I'm, I'm glad that, you know, it came together and hopefully you guys found something um, that was useful. Uh, and if you didn't, sorry. Uh, I, but other than that, I uh, hope you guys have a good day. Hey, man. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem.